Today we're talking about managing risks in projects with short fuses. And, and note that it is, it's all about just get her done, just moving things along when it comes to risk management. And the reality is the gospel that I'm going to preach today is not going to be that radically different from the gospel that I normally preach. The only difference is that the focus is on that short cycle time, that how quickly can we move risk along. And sadly, people tend to look at risk management as something that bogs things down. And that is not what risk management is all about. It's actually about moving the ball forward and getting things accomplished in a much much more effective way. And as a result, we actually tend to shorten the cycle time if we manage risk well. And so that's where my focus is going to be today. But it is going to be about just the different triple constraint. And notice my triple constraint diagram here. I've got a very short clock on the one side. And what's notable about that is generally when we have that short clock, it affords us the opportunity to look at the cost and the requirements side. Because if we know that we don't have any give on the schedule, then we do know, or at least we need to be aware of how much flexibility we have when it comes to cost and requirements. Any side of the triple constraint that represents itself as longer than the others, more flexibility buys you potentially less risk. If we have basically enough money to just throw at something at a very short time in which to make it happen, we don't have nearly so much cost risk. We're not sweating the costs, and that actually is a huge consideration. Similarly on requirements, one of the um, IT clients that I worked with for a number of years, one of the big names, and I guarantee you, you have some of their software on your desktop, but in dealing with them, it was kind of interesting because they churned out their projects in six-week cycles. It was a regular ritual six-week cycle. That was all it was. And their philosophy was make the time de-scope if you have to. Now, that's, that's actually kind of important to know, to know that if you can cut back some of the scope, well, by cutting back some of the scope, in many cases what you're doing is you are minimizing some of the risks. So one of the fundamental premises here is to recognize where do we have, um, where do we have flexibility if we do not have it on the clock. That's, that's one of the first and, and most fundamental considerations here. Because if you have no flexibility, you, you've obviously just increased your, your risks dramatically. And the things that make short cycle time risk different are these kinds of things. For one, we have to recognize that we are ready to move forward and keep moving forward even when there is risk. This, this, in, this kind of implies that your organization must have some degree of risk tolerance. Now, tolerances have been thrown around as, as a risk term for years, and frankly, most people don't understand, don't get, or don't do tolerance well. They don't identify what their tolerances are. And we're going to talk to that when we talk about the, you know, the need for a clear understanding of the tolerances. It is the fundamental element of infrastructure that we have to have in place. Also, when it comes to all the risk tools, it's funny, when I was um, writing PMBOK 4, when I was working on the risk management chapter of PMBOK 4, with the folks I worked with, two of the gentlemen I worked with on that who were uh, key contributors in that effort were both named Dave, and, and it was kind of interesting because both of the Daves were risk quants. Now, for those of you who don't, you've never heard the term of a risk quant, that's somebody who is math happy. These are people who just want to, oh, man, I want to run the numbers. I want to have just numbers, numbers, numbers. That's where, really where it all happens is in the numbers. And I was always the risk qualification guy. So when it comes to our discussions on the use of tools, don't expect me to dive into, and here's how you can use Monte Carlo quick. That's not the road I'm going down. Instead, what I would suggest to you is we want to use the simplest tools, and they are generally qualitative rather than quantitative tools. And the other thing that goes with that is that we shouldn't be using as many tools as much as we should be reusing what we've done in the past. And all of these things are going to come to the fore as we get down into our discussion of just how do you actually make all this happen. And 
the first thing is rapid iterations. And, and, and part of this, and this actually goes to now, you know, you notice I wrote Chapter 11, the risk management chapter of PMBOK 4. Now we're into PMBOK 5th edition. And for those of you who have taken a look at, and by the way, for those of you who don't speak Project Management Institute, the PMBOK is the Guide to the Project Management Body of Knowledge. It is kind of the foundation of the Project Management Institute's thinking when it comes to risk management as well as project management. And the interesting thing about uh, the PMBOK 5th edition is they've added in a whole little section on what's called futures thinking in the risk management chapter. I was really excited to see this because it ties directly to what we're talking about today. It goes, goes right to the heart of this, and that is it's the big issue here is that we want to be able to look into the crystal ball and predict not just what the risks are going to be, but instead the last three critical interview questions that are up on your screen right now. Take a look at those. It's interesting because uh, I actually got my first taste of futures thinking before I got into project management. Prior to getting into project management, I was, as, as obscene as this may sound, I was a member of the media. You know, I, and, and, yeah, sorry for those of you who have, like, loathe the media. But I was a member of the media. I was the news director at WASH Radio in Washington, D.C. And this was, like, 30 years ago. But what was interesting was I, I was the guy who got to do all the Sunday morning talk show interviews. And one of the guys I got to interview actually taught me futures thinking, only I didn't know that that's what he was teaching me. And the guy I was interviewing is somebody some of you may have heard of, particularly if you live in the States. It's a children's television star. His name is Fred Rogers. Some of you have heard of Mr. Rogers or have seen Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Yeah, the, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. That, Mr. Rogers. That's, um, yeah, so I, I had the honor of interviewing Mr. Rogers. And what was kind of compelling was when he came in, I, and I had done just a pile of celebrity interviews, and, and it, was, it was interesting because when Fred came into the studio, I did the standard celebrity thing. Whenever celebrities walked in, you were always like, oh, how can I serve you today? Would you like a cup of coffee? Is that chair going to be comfortable enough for you? And trying to just massage them and make them feel like they were loved and cared for. Well, what was interesting was I did that whole massaging routine with Fred Rogers. And he looked at me and he said, Carl, before we get started, I just need one thing. And I said, sure, Mr. Rogers, what is it? And he said, I just need you to sit down and answer one question. And I said, sure. So I sat down. And he said, this interview lasts, what, 45 minutes? And I said, yeah. And he goes, okay, great. So 45 minutes from now, an hour from now, how's the world look different? And I said, I'm sorry? And he said, how's the world look different 45 minutes from now? And I was genuinely blown away. Because that was one of the most profound questions I was ever asked in my entire life. And I was being asked it by Mr. Rogers, of all people. And, and it was. And it's a question I still dwell on. And it goes directly to futures thinking. How does the world look different when we're done? What, what's going to be changed? What is the fundamental need that we're trying to change here? And that goes to our objectives. All too often we get so wrapped up, particularly in our universe, in the IT universe, we get so wrapped up in the technical, we get so wrapped up in the, in the how we're going to do this, that we forget about, wait, 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 what's the end look like? And if you're looking at quick iterations and trying to get things done, we should, we should know, okay, fine, this is going to be three weeks, we've got to get this done in three weeks, got to churn it out. Well, by golly, we should be asking ourselves the question, okay, what 